Hey guys, got a new battery in for review today. This is a 12 volt, 460 amp hour V2 Elite Series lithium iron phosphate battery from Epoch Batteries. This new version is heated, it has Bluetooth support, and it has communication support, including to Victron equipment. This is IP67 rated, meaning it's dust proof and waterproof. They've packed a lot of functionality into this battery. Let's get started. First, let's take a quick look at some specifications. This is a Group 8D size battery. It's 20.8 inches in length, 8.6 inches in width, and 12 inches in height. It weighs in at 97 pounds. As we already stated, it's a 460 amp hour battery. That's 5,888 watt hours. It has a continuous charge current of 230 amps and a continuous discharge current of 230 amps. You can wire four batteries in series for a 48 volt system and you can connect up to 16 in parallel. Taking a look at the exterior of the battery, we have our main negative terminal and our main positive terminal and the bolts included are M8s and they have quite a bit of length to them so you can fit several cable lugs under there if you need to. We have a series of DIP switches for addressing. These are covered in detail in the manual. We have our on off power button with a little rubber protector over it here to keep it clean and uh, dry. We have a vent, a pressure vent. On the left hand side we have a little four pin connector that's going to be for the remote switch. On the right hand side we have two RJ45 connections with dust caps. The blue one is labeled Victron, that's going to be for the uh, remote display and any Victron related communications. The black one is for CAN communications and you'll use that one to connect multiple of these batteries together. On both sides we have a series of large bolt holes. They do sell a mounting bracket for this, you can use it to bolt it down to pretty much any surface. The lid for this case is held on by a series of Allen screws and they all have little blue marks which suggest somebody either torqued them or has quality checked all of them. Taking a look at the included items, we have our user's manual. We have the main communications cable here and this is the uh, remote display that's connected to it. And this includes quite the series of connections here. This one's labeled debug and there's two terminals on there. I'm not sure what that one's for. This says, uh, this looks like a CAN based connector of some kind. Um, this one's labeled Victron, so this will go to our Victron equipment. And this one's labeled meter for the remote display. And we have the RJ45 connection that will go into our Victron uh, controller, I guess. We have a bracket and some hardware for mounting the remote display. We have a series of different size bolts for the battery terminals. And we have a very long cable with a remote uh, push button switch here. Before we do anything with this battery, they want us to run a firmware update first. I'm going to run through that process here at a high level. There is an entire document on their website that describes the firmware update that I would suggest you go and read before doing it yourself. Uh, you'll need to connect this remote meter because this meter is what actually has the Bluetooth support, so you can't connect Bluetooth without having this wiring harness connected. So I've got the RJ45 with the little uh, grommet thing here, and that's going into the port with the blue dust cover. Oh, and we see it beeped there, so it must have turned on. We have our battery monitored here. It's showing 12.6 volts and 4%. You'll want the app from the store that says Epoch Lithium Ion. There are two of them. This is the one you want. So once you open your app, it'll try to find your battery and just tap the on button to get connected. Then we can go to dashboard and we can see basic information about our battery. Again, 4%, 12.6 volts. On the cells tab, we can see a few properties there at the top. We have the average voltage, the voltage differential, which is the voltage between the lowest cell and the highest cell. We have uh, V low is the lowest cell and V high is the high cell. Now I am not sure why it keeps uh, flipping on and off there, but we do need to run the firmware update per their requirement before doing anything. To initiate that process, we'll go to the about tab, find the OTA button in the top right, and you'll tap and hold until you get a password prompt. The password is test, all lowercase, T-E-S-T. It'll prompt with some firmware selections. We'll need to run the EMS update first and then the BMS update. It's going to download your update. So you wanna click the green start button one time. And there we go. So it's doing some stuff on the phone and on the remote display, we can see it showing 2% as well. So it's looking like this is going to take a little while. I'm just going to set it down and I'll come back in a few minutes and see where we're at. It took about, uh, what's that, five minutes? And once it completed, our battery did restart on its own. So after waiting about 30 seconds, I'm clicking the back button. Running through this process again, tap and hold OTA. The password is test and confirm. And now I'm ready for the BMS update. This is the 12 volt, 460 amp hour battery. So I'll want the first BMS option there. And the same deal as last time, I'll tap the start button and I'll just let it run here. All right, upgrade is complete. 
Now I do see the display here is still showing 65%, so I think part of it is actually still running. All right, I guess it's, up. Oh, there it goes. I was waiting for it to restart. All right, and we should be updated. So if I click back here, uh, so now we can take a look at the cell information here and it's not flashing on and off like it was before. So yes, you definitely want to do the firmware update as the manufacturer suggests before you do anything else with your battery. All right, this battery has finished charging. I used my Ames 12 volt lithium iron phosphate rated charger. Uh, I have it on my AMREL capacity tester here, so I can go ahead and disconnect the charger at this point. And our test is in progress. We are discharging at 60 amps. The limit of this AMREL electronic load is 800 watts, so that's pretty much the max rating of the E-load. And I'll leave this run until the BMS in the battery shuts off. The capacity test finished at 475 amp hours. Taking a look at the test report, we ran for 7 hours, 54 minutes, and 56 seconds. We started at 13.46 volts, and we ended at 10.12 volts. Alright guys, so I removed all of these Allen head screws that were the whole way around the case, and the lid does not come off. And it appears as though uh, this lid was set down over top of these terminals, and then this epoxy uh, silicone stuff was put in here. Silicone, not epoxy. It's actually silicone because it's soft and squishy, and I think I have to dig out all of that silicone in order to take this lid off. For example, on the negative side here, I've dug that out, and we can see the lid now lifts off over that terminal. Uh, that is kind of annoying because I really like the way this looks, and I don't want to ruin it. That is a little bit disappointing to have to dig out silicone to open the battery, but as I say in most of these videos, these are not designed to be opened or user serviceable. This battery is insane inside. I don't even know where to start. First of all, look at all the communications cables on both sides of this battery. Look at the size of these bus bars coming off of that BMS. They are huge. This gray thing is a huge thermal pad on top of this BMS in that metal, that metal thing on top that is located right here is actually a gigantic aluminum heat sink. So that is sinking heat from the inside of the battery from this BMS outside the case to help cool your battery. Additionally, look at the size of this fuse. That thing is massive. The top cover there says 400 amp, 20 volts DC, 150 degrees Celsius, and it is a UL listed component there. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this is. The website calls it a current, a current and thermal fuse. So we see there's a line drawn across here and it says ATC01. Uh, then there's a segment that comes off. It says R1, presumably a resistor, ATC2, and then a line exits here on the side. So I don't know if this maybe is part of the heating circuit, the heating control circuit. Now, to be completely honest, this is the first time I've opened a battery and there's just so much going on that it's difficult to explain what's going where. And that's made more difficult by the fact that everything is like wrapped up here. So it's difficult to trace the wires. From what I've found, the positive that comes off of this fuse, there's a connector over here that says fuse control, fuse CTL. I assume CTL is control. Uh, and it's got two positives and two negatives. Aside from that, let's see what else we can find. I see there's a uh, temperature sensor here on the main positive terminal. There's another temperature sensor over here on the main negative terminal. We do have a lead that comes off the positive and a lead that comes off the negative. This is going to be after the BMS. Those are going up to this connector here, which feeds the front. On the top right here, you can see a pair of wires that have some sort of insulation on them. Those are the heating circuit wires and they come back to this connector here, which are labeled heat plus and heat minus. The label on this heating conductor says 14.6 volts, 180 watts, and 1.18 ohms. There are two other positives coming off here and a positive here, I'm unsure of what they do. The same on the negative here, there's a second negative coming off, I'm not sure what it does. There are a ton of wires going into the back of this BMS. I assume most of those are communications cables. This connector here has multiple leads labeled CAN. There's CAN and CAN2, and it looks like this battery actually has multiple CAN bus circuits in it. And then additionally, some of these leads are actually spliced within this wiring harness, so it's making it very difficult to trace. I'm going to see if I can very carefully pull back this wiring harness. I do want to see what's in the actual battery, but I did take several pictures of all the connectors and the layout of the cabling, so hopefully I can figure out where everything goes back once it's time to put it back together. All right, there's our BMS. So this, uh, this terminal here is actually welded onto this piece of metal here. Uh, so one thing I did notice though is there's some sort of adhesive between there. Uh, it looks like some kind of epoxy. I think it might be a conductive epoxy. Not 100% sure on that. That's just my guess. This has to be one of the largest BMSs I've seen so far. Look how thick that is. 
Uh, whatever that material is, they have it smashed between all of the bus bars as well. Uh, I'm wondering if it's just some sort of antioxidant compound. 400 amp fuse. You can really see how big it is in relation to my hand here. I'm hoping I can simply take this whole wiring harness and lay it around the side. Once again, notice the torque marks on just practically everything. There's not one but two. There's black and there's blue. Every single bolt, every screw. Oh, that's loose. There we go. And there's plastic under there. And unfortunately, it also looks like this battery is glued. So I'm gonna try to snip those zip ties and see if I can take out this plastic cover. First look over this battery, we see the balance leads here. They are labeled uh, B00, B01 all the way to B04. And I, I can't see how they are attached. I don't see any ring terminal there, so I assume they're probably laser welded onto these, these bus bars. This right here is going to be a temperature sensor directly on the post of this battery. That is perfect. Uh, over here we see a second temperature sensor, again, on the post of the battery here. These bus bars are aluminum and they are welded. I see the cells are combined in groupings of two. So these two are wired in parallel. Then they're wired in series with these two, which are then wired in series with these two and so forth. So that tells me that these are 230 amp hour cells. 230 plus 230 gives you the 460 amp hour rating. And then putting four of them in series gives you your 12.8 volts nominal voltage. Now these cells have a layer of foam that was set down over the cell before these bus bars were welded in place. So it's very difficult for me to pull that up and actually see the cells themselves. Additionally, there's a piece of plastic running down the center here. However, I did uh, very carefully cut out a piece here so I can see the original QR code. And I do see that these are Eve brand cells and they are model number LF230 or 230 amp hour cells exactly as I had suspected. Now, once again, this battery pack unfortunately is glued to the bottom of this case. Most batteries, I would rip them apart and cut the case and stuff to get it out, but I really don't want to ruin and destroy this battery. So I'm just going to leave it in the case as it is. So taking a look at some of the wiring harness here, we can see the balance lead actually has this little connector on. Uh, so the person manufacturing this battery presumably can run the balance lead and affix it to the cells, the battery pack, and then simply set this battery pack in the case and then plug it into the rest of the wiring harness. That leaves four conductors over here in three of these heat insulative shields. Uh, these two here are powering the heater. This one, I can't quite make out where it goes. I do believe I've traced these cables and I see one says wake ground and one says wake out. So I don't know if there's some sort of thermal switch down in there. You know, perhaps when the battery is empty and has been sitting overnight and you need to begin charging, maybe that's how they turn it on. I'm just making a complete guess on that. I can't tell where these cables are actually going. One thing I did find interesting is the heater's running the entire length of the top of the case here, uh, the entire side of this battery but there's no heater on this side of the battery and I really would have expected to see a heater on both sides. If we take a look along the side of the battery here, you can see an orange mat. That is the heater pad. It's running the entire surface area of the side of the battery here. We can see a steel band down in there. There are two steel bands holding this battery pack together. And then if you look all the way down in the bottom of the case down in there, you see that green stuff. That is the glue. Uh, some sort of glue, I don't know if it's silicone or epoxy or something. If we take a look at the end of the battery, you can see an aluminum plate there and there's the steel band again, just clamping this battery together, fixing it in place. I'm not sure there's too much else for me to see or explain in here, so I'm gonna try to get this put back together the best I can. Let's take a quick look at our BMS here. I don't see any apparent brand name anywhere. Perhaps this is a model number, maybe a serial number. I'm not 100% sure, but the only thing I can determine for sure is it says 4S here, 4S BMS for four cells in series. Again, we have this large thermal pad here to help move heat from the BMS to the exterior of the case. This has a very beefy heat sink, as I've mentioned here. We're sitting at four millimeters in thickness. And the bottom plate is four millimeters in thickness as well here. Ah, so on the top of the BMS here, I do see it says Roy Pow. I'm going to make an educated guess that this is probably where the balance leads come in. And these are probably the resistors here for bypass or bleeding off the excess power. This is a passive BMS. So any excess energy when it's balancing the cells is bled off as heat. Uh, we have our MOSFETs here, our FET transistors. I know everybody likes when I say FET transistors, but these are the FET slash transistors for those of you that like to pick at my words. Under here, we have another temperature sensor. So we are getting a temperature reading of the, the FET area. Uh, right down here, we have a series of resistors, which I believe are acting as a shunt, so it can measure the amount of current flowing through. And on the other side, we see more of the same, some more FETs and some more shunting resistors there. There's not much else I'm able to explain on here. Like I said, this is quite a bit more complex than the BMSs I'm used to looking at, and I am certainly not an engineer. 
Next, it's time to try the low temperature charge protection and the heating functionality of this battery. So I've got sort of a, a crude setup here just because of the number of wiring harnesses and connectors that need to be in place for this to work. I have my Ames charger connected to the negative and the positive here. I also removed both of the temperature sensors from the battery because uh, once you put this whole thing back together, you can't get down in there with the free spray. We'll use this clamp meter here just so we can see the amount of current going in. I'll spray the sensors with a little bit of this computer duster. Uh, it typically goes well below freezing, so it's a good way to test. We are charging at 54 amps. And we do have a reading on this display that says CLT, which I thought was control originally, but maybe it means charge low temperature. I'm not sure, uh, but it is still charging. So maybe there's a delay here. So the CLT now disappeared and we're putting 12 amps in, which must be powering the heater because the display also shows zero amps. Uh, so we are powering that heater with 12 amps. And then once this battery warms back up, we should begin charging and we should see that reflected on the remote display as well. It's difficult for me to pin down how exactly this is working because I sprayed both of these sensors and I had to spray this sensor on the positive post here. I also sprayed that fuse, which I don't think does anything, but it was, it was delaying longer than I would have expected. I can tell you that it does work. I just can't pinpoint the exact logic being used by this BMS. It appears to be taking feedback from a variety of different sensors to know when to turn on and off that heater. All right, and we began charging again, 54 amps over here and uh, 52.3 amps over here. Now I see why they call this the Elite Series. I can't think of any other battery I reviewed that has come close to the amount of engineering or just the amount of stuff they have going on. They've really built this battery to last, especially in marine or mobile applications where you're more subject to environmental concerns such as heat, cold, you know, moisture, vibration. One thing I haven't touched on despite how long this video has become is the communication support with Victron equipment. And that was one of their primary marketing points. I am going to see if I can pick up some equipment, some, you know, an inverter or something uh, to try and see if I can get that working. And hopefully I'll have a follow-up video for you here in a month or two. Anyway, I've gone on long enough. I'm going to leave some links down in the video description if you want to learn more about this battery. Any questions or comments, please leave those. Hit that like button before you go. And thanks for watching.